If you were taken to an isolated mansion and forced to play in an insane death game, what would you do? These seven strangers need to pick someone to sacrifice, but they're about to find out the hard way that they have more in common than any of them want to admit. One way or another, the truth is coming out, and I'm here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the sacrifice choice in Death's Roulette. <laughs> These people are about to realize that no matter how far you run, your past always catches up with you. This young woman wakes up on the floor with her hands tied together and notices another man using a nearby statue to set himself free. He saws through the rope and crawls over to her, helping her untie her hands while the other captives start to come to their senses. Looking around, they realize that they're in the parlor of someone's enormous mansion, but they don't know each other or have any idea why they're brought here. The man goes to help the others, untie tying them one by one until all seven are free. They're sealed in by a huge metal door, and outside the window is nothing but a sheer drop from a jagged cliff. Coming soon to a theater near you, how to beat official Patreon. All the guts, all the blood, all the screams, plus nasty extras. How to beat Patreon. Two times the shock, two times the terror, two times the subscription levels. Have a damn good day, and it only gets better. Both levels bid you welcome to pre-sales for ghoulish official How to Beat merchandise and support the evil scientists behind the How to Beat videos. It only gets better subscribers are invited to the X-rated party. Ad-free and uncensored videos too repulsive for all audiences are available on demand. How to Beat Patreon. In space, no one can hear you scream, but on Patreon, everyone can see you bleed. How to Beat Patreon. Join us if you dare. The seven captives sit down to collect their thoughts and try to figure out what the hell is going on. The first guy gets up and pours himself a glass of water, pointing out that it's probably not poisoned because if whoever captured them wanted to kill them, they probably would have done that already. He hands the stewardess a glass before asking the others if anyone remembers how they ended up here. It turns out that they were all kidnapped while going about their normal business, but now the question turns to why. The man in the suit and tie thinks that they're being held for ransom. until this this grandpa speaks up and says something horrifying. He tells them that the kidnappers tortured him for hours and never asked him for any money or information, seemingly only wanting to make him suffer. The man in the button-down goes to check him out, finding that his fingernails have all been torn off as a part of the punishment. Realizing that the person who took them wants more than just money, they decide to introduce themselves to each other to see if they all have anything in common. The first guy is Lieutenant Simon Cruz, an investigator for the Mexico City Police. Next is the family, with the father, Esteban, and mother, Marta who are extremely wealthy business people, and their daughter Lupe, a human rights lawyer. The man in the button-down shirt introduces himself as Armando, a surgeon, followed by the other woman, Teresa the stewardess. Finally, there's the old man, Jose, who only says that he's retired. Suddenly, an old radio in the middle of the room comes to life, displaying a message that they're all here to play a game, and a voice on the speaker system reads off the rules. They must choose one member of the group to die, and that person must agree to be killed, but no one is allowed to volunteer. They have one hour to make their decision, and if they can't choose or refuse to play, then they'll all be killed. An alarm sounds as a digital clock on the wall begins the countdown, and the captives start to panic as the madness begins. Okay, this is pretty bad, but for a death game, it could be much worse. Still, they've only got one hour to choose someone to sacrifice or come up with another plan, so what should they do? Let's start by quickly looking at our contestants and the rules of the game to see what we can figure out with a little critical thinking. First of all, the rules just don't make sense to me. Choosing one person to be sacrificed is straightforward enough, but rules two and three are conflicting. Whoever they choose has to agree to be killed, but can't volunteer? And aren't those essentially the same thing? Let's say they have a vote and choose Esteban. And out of the want to save his daughter and wife's lives, he agrees to be the sacrifice. How would the killer distinguish between him agreeing and him volunteering? I don't know, I guess it adds up, but I prefer my death game rules to have a little less room for interpretation. Then we've got our seven captives. 
They've all ended up here for a reason, and that's probably as a consequence for something horrible that they've done in their past. There's also a very strong chance that one of them is the Psycho, who trapped them all in there. So right now, we can't trust anyone, especially not the Grandpa. Because if I learn anything from watching Squid Game, it's never to trust the old man. I'll admit, if he is in on it, then putting himself through torture and ripping off his own fingernails is some pretty serious commitment to the bit. So anything's possible. What's not possible is to tell for certain who's innocent and who's guilty right now. And honestly, I don't care about any of that nearly as much as I care about getting out of here with my life. So it's time to start working on a plan to survive. If we're going to play by the game's rules, the most logical thing to do is vote for the grandpa to be the sacrifice, since he's the oldest and has the least left to live for. The problem is, he'll have to agree, and we can't count on that, especially if he's the one behind all of this. I'd point out to the group that nobody is going to agree to sacrifice themselves, so if we want to get out of here alive, we need to work together to come up with a way to escape. Now, the killer won't like us teaming up, and there's probably going to be some consequences. So I'd want to do something to try and confuse them. I'd start telling all of the men and women to quickly switch clothes. Then I'd break one of the light bulbs from the lamps and use the sharp glass to cut seven identical masks. With our outfits swapped and our faces covered, it would make it more difficult to distinguish who is who and if their leader is actually one of us then their henchmen might not want to take the chance of taking someone out. If anyone disagreed with doing this, then that would put them right at the top of my list of suspects. After that, I'm looking at that giant window at the end of the room as our best chance to get out. I'd start by using a pointy part from one of the smaller statues to attack the edges and try to get the window to shatter. With a couple hundred foot drop from the cliff waiting for you, there's no way you're getting out of there by going down, but that doesn't mean that you can't go up instead. And the outside surface is covered in vines that you could use to try and climb to freedom. It's time to act fast, and we'll have to see if our contestants take some action before it's too late. The surgeon and stewardess start to pound on the door, begging to be let out, but Marta tells them to calm down, saying that her family's influential friends will come to their rescue. Armando points out that they don't have much time to wait, and argues that they need to choose someone to sacrifice or they'll all end up dead. Trying to save her own skin, Teresa chimes in that the women shouldn't have to participate, but the men don't let that slide since this is the year 2023 and they believe in equality, especially during a death game. The group is at a stalemate until Jose finally speaks up, saying that they should choose him because he's the oldest. Everyone likes that idea since it gets them off the hook. That is, except for our bleeding heart human rights lawyer, of course. She asks the old man if he has a family, and he responds that he lives alone. Despite the circumstances pointing to him as the obvious choice, she argues that his life matters just as much as anyone else's. The surgeon challenges her to take his place if that's the way she really feels. But instead, she proposes that they decide by a lottery. That would make the decision less personal, although nobody is willing to leave their lives up to chance. They each make their argument as to why they deserve to live more than all of the others, with Armando pointing out that his medical expertise saves dozens of people every year, and Marta saying that they have thousands of employees whose family rely on the jobs that they provide to keep food on the table. Tired of the bickering, the old man speaks up again, telling them to just have a vote and choose him. Lupe protests, but the others have made their decision, and the women thank him for his sacrifice. Seeing this as an opportunity to get some things off his mind before he goes up to that big retirement home in the sky, the old man confesses that he's done things in his life that he's not proud of, and the cop leans in to find out what he means. Just then, a trap door in the wall opens up, and a blonde-haired man raises a hunting rifle, shooting Jose once in the head and killing him instantly before disappearing back into the wall. That makes one victim down with six more to go, but the game is only just getting started. The voice on the radio returns and explains to the group that Jose's sacrifice was for nothing. He broke the third rule, no volunteering to be killed. And because of this, the death game must continue. Realizing that these kidnappers really mean business, they'll have to play by the rules if any of them wants to survive. Okay, well, I guess that clears the old man of any suspicion. Psycho's faking their own death is nothing new, but his brains splattered on the couch are telling me that this one was for real. Things are quickly going from bad to worse, and there's still just under an hour to figure out what to do. 
so we need to use this moment to adjust our strategy. With the old man down, that leaves only six captives, shortening the list of who among them could be the killer. At this point, I'd be paying very close attention to everyone's behaviors and reactions to what was going on, waiting for one of them to slip up and do something suspicious that could give them away. One good thing is that now we have a better idea of what exactly we're up against. There's at least two killers, they have a gun, and they can pop through trap doors in the wall. I'm thinking that if we continue to break the rules, then we might be able to get those two henchmen to show up again, but this time, I'll be ready for them. It's risky, but if you wait just off to the side of the door for them to open it up, you might be able to get the jump on them and turn the tables. The most important thing would be to go for the weapon. Disarming them would be your only chance at making a fair fight. And if you could get your hands on the rifle, then you'd really be in business. It's not going to be easy, but when your only other option is to just keep playing along with the death game, it's probably worth a shot. If we're not going to fight, then our only option right now is to play along and try to outsmart the other players when we have an opportunity. Anything can happen, so we all have to be on our guard if we're going to survive. Esteban tries to offer them $10 million to spare his family's life, but the countdown continues as an alarm sounds and the huge metal doors swing open on their own. Simon heads in first, followed by the others, and they cautiously creep down the hallway full of disturbing paintings until they come to a balcony overlooking a parlor with a light-up letterboard in the center. Downstairs, Armando finds a stack of envelopes labeled Reed and opens the first one up, revealing a card that explains the rules for the next challenge. They'll have to answer a series of nine questions, with the first letter of each answer spelling out the name of their kidnapper. What they don't know is that they'll also be revealing some of their darkest secrets. The victims gather in the center of the room, and the game begins. The first clue calls for the name of Esteban's company figurehead. He refuses to answer, but his wife admits that the man's name is Pereira, and the cop fills in the first section of the board. Next is Teresa's secret addiction, and the surgeon correctly guesses that the answer is amphetamines based on her obvious withdrawal symptoms. Third, Lupe falsified her diploma from high school, revealing that she's not such an academic achiever after all. Clue number four is Lorenzo, the name of Simon's partner who is exposed for corruption. Approaching the halfway mark, they arrive at the fifth clue and the answer shocks the family. It calls for Marta's sister's name, but Lupe insists that her mother is an only child. Marta admits that her name was Ophelia, who she claims died very young before her daughter was born, which is why they never knew each other. Clue number six simply reads, Jose is a, and they fill in the blank with the Spanish word for retiree. Seventh is Teresa's dealer's nickname, Elf. Eighth, an STD suffered by Armando, gonorrhea. Finally, they come to the ninth clue, the name of Esteban's second lover, and the mother admits that her name was Alejandra, his secretary. Simon steps back from the board, and the first letters of each answer spell out the name Pablo Giga. The name doesn't seem to be ringing any bells at first. Turning back to the letters, Simon replaces the J with a V, revealing their kidnapper's true identity, Pablo Vega. The puzzle is solved, but what connection do they all have to this man? Simon explains that the man is a murderer who sees himself as a hero with a reputation for kidnapping and torture killing corrupt government officials. His favorite tactic is to make victims play his morbid games, even going so far as to gut a judge and force his family to play hangman with his blood. During his work as a police officer, he spent years trying to track him down, but every time that he got close, Pablo would mysteriously slip away. Everyone starts to get nervous, knowing, but not yet ready to admit that they all have shameful connections to this man. Without explanation, Armando starts to shout to the killer, swearing that he did everything he could to save an unidentified identified woman and begging the man to hear him out. The others ask him what he's talking about, and he reluctantly admits that Pablo's mother, Patricia, died in his operating room after being involved in a hit-and-run car accident. He says that the woman's injuries were too severe for her to recover, but that's when Teresa decides to chime in. Furious, she admits to being the driver of the car that hit the woman. After fleeing from the scene, Teresa was overcome with regret and visited the many hospitals until she found her, insisting that the nurse said that she only suffered fractures to her legs and should have survived. 
The two argue until Armando raises his hand, saying that he votes for Teresa to be killed, just as punishment for her crime. Suddenly, a fortune-telling machine rattles to life, as if it were waiting for the perfect moment to reveal the whole truth. The machine begins to play the testimony of a nurse from the hospital, explaining that Armando botched the simple surgery despite his team's warning that he was performing it wrong, which resulted in the woman's unnecessary death. Now that they know what really happened, Teresa raises her hand and votes for the doctor to be killed. Esteban chimes in and points out that there are only six of them, meaning that his family of three has more voting power than any of the others. Since they won't vote for each other, that essentially leaves the other three to decide which one of them it's going to be. Even with the cheating allegations, Marta insists that she won't turn on her husband, but Simon points out that none of them are innocent, including the family, and wants to know what they did to end up on Pablo's hit list before he makes his vote. The other two agree, and now it's the family's turn to own up to their misdeeds. Backed into a corner, Marta admits that his mother worked as a servant in their house for some time before getting pregnant and resigning. The doctor accuses Esteban of being the father, which he passionately denies, but even Lupe is starting to doubt him. Just when it seems like he's about to crack, a metal door on the other side of the room swings open, and they put the conversation on hold to see what's on the other side, with just over 33 minutes left before they're all killed. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. We have the killer's name and how they're all connected to him, but freedom is still a long way off. Based on what we've just found out, out of the six of them, Simon, Armando, and Teresa have definitely pissed the killer off the most. Right now, I'd vote for the stewardess to be the sacrifice, since her hit and run was the reason Pablo's mother ended up in the hospital, leading to her death during the botched surgery. The problem is, she's not going to agree to be killed, so what are we going to do? The only real bargaining chip that we have is Lupe, since her parents will obviously want to protect their daughter. If none of the other three are going to agree to be killed, then that leaves Marta and Esteban to decide between themselves who it's going to be. Since they have the most to lose here, it's a perfectly valid strategy to just threaten to wait the time out and let everyone die, including their daughter unless one of them agrees to be the sacrifice. Now, there's no guarantee that the killer is just going to let us walk away even if we do pick someone, but getting past that stage should at least draw them out and give us more options to work with. Besides playing along with the game and waiting to see what happens, escaping is still your only other real option. If you're paying attention, then there's one item in this room that could be useful for your purposes, the swing set ride. It's built to hold four children, and let's say they'd be about 10 years old. The average 10-year-old boy weighs about 70 pounds, meaning that the motor within the ride should have the capacity to pull at least 280 pounds before it stalls out. It's a long shot, but if you could take apart the ride and get to the motor, you might be able to use it and the chains to create a mechanism that could forcefully pull open the electronically locked metal doors and get into the next areas without having to play along with the game. Of course, any attempt to do this is most likely going to result in another attack by the henchmen, so you might end up needing to use the chains as weapons in the worst case scenario. With their options limited, it's necessary to start thinking outside of the box, or just keep going with the game and hope for another opportunity to present itself. We'll have to see what's waiting for them on the other side of those doors, and if anyone manages to make it out alive. The six of them walk down the creepy hallway and into the next room where they find an art gallery full of horrific paintings. The voice on the radio returns, ordering them to seek the truth in the details, and the group begins to look around the room as the timer ticks away. Marta pulls Esteban to the side, whispering that he must let her die if their real secret comes out and they're forced to choose. He insists that they'll all turn on each other before it comes to that. Meanwhile, Lupe speaks to the stewardess and finds out that she has a school-aged son. Due to her pill addiction, the boy lives with his father, and she's worried that she won't be able to provide a future for him even if she manages to make it out of there alive. The girls go their separate ways, and Lupe immediately goes to tell her parents that they can use the child as a bargaining chip. Armando grabs a picture from the table and shares it with the others, leading them to a shocking revelation. It's caption, 
mom with Uncle Esteban, and Aunt Marta in Paris. And just like that, their whole house of cards comes crashing down. Lupe realizes that the woman in the picture is her Aunt Ophelia, which would make her and Pablo cousins. For now, the parents refuse to explain. Pressing them for details, Simon takes a painting down from the wall that shows how Pablo was born in a mental hospital. Marta realizes that the jig is officially up. She explains that Ophelia was her older sister, who experienced troubles with depression and psychosis throughout her whole life, until her father decided to commit her to a mental hospital. The treatment seemed to be working until one day she was assaulted by a member of the staff and became pregnant with a baby boy. The family tried to convince her not to have the baby, but she refused and ultimately died during childbirth. The boy was born with a distinctive mark on his arm, and Marta left him in the care of the hospital worker, refusing to give up on her ambitions as a businesswoman. The others slam the family for turning their back on her sister and the boy, saying that it's their fault he turned into a killer and trapped them in this twisted game. The surgeon asks Simon and Teresa if there's anything that could happen that would make them decide to die, and they both say no. He then turns to Esteban, explaining that since none of them are willing to be sacrificed, they'll all be going down together, and the parents will be forced to watch their daughter be killed. It's a convincing argument, but the business people have one last trick up their sleeves, and Marta makes her play. She approaches Teresa, saying that she knows she has a son and offering to buy her out. The price is set, $1 million for the boy, guaranteeing him a successful future, but only if Teresa agrees to be killed so that the others can go free. It's a convincing argument, but Teresa won't go for it, and she throws the deal right back in their arrogant faces. And now it's time for another vote. Simon raises his hand, casting a vote to sacrifice Esteban, and the others join him. Out of options, Esteban agrees, but Marta won't let it go. She demands that they choose her and the group changes their vote. Only 11 minutes remain on the board and Marta kneels in the center of the room, begging Pablo to kill her. Suddenly, the timer stops and an alarm begins to sound, but no one shows up to kill the woman. Another metal door slides open and the group passes through, the family picking up Marta and following close behind. Okay, it looks like we all just found out who's the most to blame for our contestants ending up in a psycho's death game. They might think that money can solve all of their problems, but now that they're up against a killer who can't be bought, this rich family has to face something they never hoped to see, the consequences of their actions. Now it's clear where everything went wrong, and I think we can safely say, Marta, you f up. We could tell from your attitude and decisions during the game so far that you were one selfish person, but boy, did we not know the half of it. When your own older sister was struggling with depression, you decided that the best thing to do would be to send her to an asylum for electroshock therapy while you pursue your dreams of marrying a wealthy businessman and living high on the hog of other people's hard work. But that's not even the worst of it. Your poor sister was assaulted by one of the employees and died during childhood birth, and even with all of your wealth and power, you decided to abandon the boy with a nurse and let her deal with raising the kid, since taking care of him didn't fit in with your professional ambitions. Back when you were bargaining for your lives, you tried to make a big deal about the 80,000 workers that your husband's company employs who rely on you to survive, but couldn't even open your pocketbook to help out your own nephew when he needed you the most. You could have at least checked in with him once in a while, you know, just to see how things were going and make sure that he wasn't turning into a serial killer bent on revenge. Every single person that he's killed, that's all on you. Honestly, I can't blame him for bringing you here and forcing you to own up to your actions. Now your own daughter is trapped in his house of horrors and all the money in the world can't save you. They climb up a staircase onto another balcony, this time overlooking a luxurious dining room with an enormous feast spread out on the table. They notice that there's a place marked for each of them and sit down in their seats for what's sure to be an awkward supper. Teresa finds a pill container with her fix inside and the surgeon suggests that she take it to ward off the effects of withdrawal. But after considering it for a moment, she refuses. He pours himself a glass of wine, encouraging them all to eat so they won't die with empty stomachs. Lupe points out that they're all still alive and the timer is stopped, thinking that maybe Pablo has forgiven them. But the doctor isn't so sure. 
After all, would he really kidnap them and murder a man right in front of their eyes only to feed them a delicious meal and send them home? The conversation turns to Jose, and Simon finally realizes that he was the one who assaulted Ophelia, impregnating her with the boy. Just then, he reaches for another bite to eat and slices his finger on something hidden inside the food. The doctor goes to investigate, pulling out a massive hunting knife with the message, do it yourself, hanging from its handle. The alarm rings, and the timer starts counting down again. Armando stands up brandishing the knife as everyone else jumps out of their seats and backs away across the room. He insists that they need to kill Marta, promising that he'll use his experience as a surgeon to do it in a way where she won't have to suffer. As he lunges for the woman, Esteban grabs his arm, smashing a glass over his head and driving the blade into his stomach. The doctor collapses to the floor. Simon tries to help but the man insists that nothing can be done. Realizing that this is their best chance at escape, the group casts their vote to sacrifice Armando, and he agrees to die so that the others can go free. Esteban grabs the knife, and Armando instructs him to stab him straight in the heart. Esteban pushes the knife into his heart, killing him. That makes two victims down, with five more to go. The timer stops with just a fraction of a second left as a door on the other side of the room slides open. Simon takes the knife from the doctor's chest and the survivors follow him down the hall. They head up a winding flight of stairs, finally seeing the light of day, but realize that they're in the middle of an enormous hedge maze. Pressing onward, Esteban waits for the others to get a few steps ahead before telling his family that they should split off from the group but they don't make it far before Lupe starts to panic, insisting that they turn around and head back. Meanwhile, two of Pablo's accomplices are following close behind, and the woman opens fire with her AK as soon as she sees the family, causing them to run for their lives. Hearing the shot, Teresa takes off running, leaving Simon behind. Okay, is there a doctor in the house? I mean, besides the one who just got stabbed. The others may have managed to escape, but it looks like making it out of the mansion was just the beginning. This close to freedom is no time to be splitting up and making dumb decisions. Luckily, there's a foolproof method for finding your way out of any maze that our survivors could use. As soon as the maze started, what they needed to do was immediately touch one hand to the other side of the hedge, and then continue all the way through without ever taking it off. It'll be slow going, but it's also guaranteed to work as long as you never remove your hand, because taking the edges of the maze and straightening them out would essentially form a giant loop. You can try this out for yourself even with pen and paper. Just pick a wall at the beginning and stick to it, and you'll find your way to the finish line every time. Now, I'm not sure just how impenetrable those hedges are, but just pushing right through them might also be a viable strategy. Since none of them were going solo, at least at first, the guys could've put one of the women on their shoulders, so she could peek above the hedges and try to find their way out. Doing that would expose her to sniper fire from Slim Shady and his girlfriend, of course. But that's why you gotta bob and weave. It is a death game after all, so you're gonna have to take some risks. Just hope to hell that you can get out of there before the killer track you down. Teresa comes to a wooden bridge and stops to take a look, opening her pill container only to drop it through the boards into the dirt below. She makes it under the bridge just in time as the woman with the AK turns the corner and climbs overhead. Once the coast is clear, Teresa runs until she finds an exit, stepping out to freedom only to be hilariously run over by a speeding pickup truck. That's a bummer, because the real surprise is when she finds out who was behind the wheel, her fellow captive, Simon, aka Pablo Vega. She begs him to let her go, but Pablo only gets back in his car. That makes three victims down, the killer revealed, and three more to go. Meanwhile, the family runs through the maze pursued by the blonde man with the rifle. They quickly turn a corner and hide just out of sight, letting him pass before crawling through a hole in the hedge and heading for a boat parked just off the beach. Okay, Teresa, didn't anyone ever teach you to look both ways before crossing the road? Well, I guess you found out that one the hard way. Now, I had to chime in here and talk to our family of sociopaths because seriously, could there have ever been a more perfect opportunity to jump this guy and take his gun? He was right there. Sometimes you gotta risk it for the biscuit. Sure, he has a rifle, but it's also got a barrel larger than the list of terrible things that they've done. There is no way that he could have spun that thing around in time to get an accurate shot off. 
you've got him in a three on one, so throw a spear tackle his way. Once he's taken care of, I'd post up in a sniper position on one of those wooden bridges and smoke the other minion before she even saw it coming. I've been waiting for an opportunity to bring the pain this whole time, and when he was right within their grasp, they just let him walk away to shoot them another day. At least they made it to the boat, but they're about to find out that Pablo isn't done with them just yet. They climb aboard, but just as they're about to leave, Pablo, who they still think is Simon, comes swimming up behind them and gets on. The man takes off his jacket, and Marta notices the scar on his arm, and he draws two guns, pointing them straight at their heads. Pablo orders the man and woman to get to one side of the boat before handing them a revolver with one bullet in the chamber, demanding they play a game of Russian roulette or he'll kill their daughter. Marta is made to go first, but she can't pull the trigger, so Pablo decides to give her some inspiration. He reveals that Esteban didn't really sleep with his secretary. Her husband was a serial abuser of Lupe's young classmates, and his own daughter was one of the victims. But what's even more disturbing is that Marta knew what was going on the whole time, and is just as guilty as her husband for turning a blind eye. Pablo hands Esteban the revolver instead, and he pulls the trigger without a second thought. The chamber was empty, and now it's Marta's turn again. But that's when the two accomplices come walking down the beach. Pablo tells Lupe to sign to them that everything is under control, revealing that the girl has been in on it the whole time. Okay, now I hate to give Marta any advice here since she's such a horrible person, but it's kind of my job to get out of these situations. So just in case you ever end up in her position, here's what I would have done. She's been sticking up for her husband this whole time, but after Esteban tried to kill her in cold blood without batting an eye, to me, all bets are off. Once I got my hands on the revolver, instead of shooting him, I grab Esteban to use as a meat shield while I try to take out Pablo with my one bullet. I may only have one shot, but the good news is that I never miss, so Pablos, adios, pendejo. With the killer down, the only thing left to do would be to speed off into the sunset before his henchmen came. Oh, and push Lupe overboard in open waters for portraying me. Something tells me Marta isn't really up to the job, though, and we're about to see why you've always got to take the shot when you have the chance. Lupe points the revolver at her father, and Pablo tells her to finish him. But she's not willing to do it, so the killer raises his pistol and shoots the man once in the head. That makes four victims down, with two survivors. Taking Marta back to the mansion, Pablo straps her to a table and tortures her with electric shock therapy. His accomplice goes out to the cliff and digs five graves. Back in the room where it all began, he and Lupe look out over the sunset, their unholy revenge finally complete. But what would you do? If you woke up in a room full of strangers and were told by an off-screen presence that you guys had to kill each other off one by one, have you seen enough death games by now to know what you would do? Or would you need to follow this video to a T to make it out alive? Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments down below what you would do. And don't forget from now on, we upload on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.